uh, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. Um, in today's session, we are going to be covering the Fronius products and solutions. This forms um, part of a three series, which I'm going to be introducing to you uh, briefly. Uh, but before we get there, I would like to introduce to you my colleagues who will be doing the joint uh, presentation together. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Cyprian Okolo uh, from West Africa, the TSA, based in Lagos, Nigeria. And as well, Mohamed Sidat, uh, based in Johannesburg, South Africa, from South, uh, Fronia, South Africa, which is a subsidiary of South Africa. So the three of us together will be doing the webinar today and uh, cover all the topics uh, for today's session. Um, our series today starts with uh, Fronia's products and solutions where you're going to be covering a three, uh, the Snap Inverter series. Um, this of course being a three-part series, we will continue with it for the next uh, two weeks. And next week, we'll be covering the monitoring options uh, and look at what are the possibilities of monitoring your systems through the monitoring portal offered by Fronius. And then the last part of the three-part series uh, will be on the Fronius hybrid and off-grid solutions. Um, so if you are a new installer or you have no experience at all with Fronius uh, products and solutions, we would encourage you to follow this three-part series because this is going to offer you a lot of uh, fast hard information that you need to know about the possibilities with Fronia's products and solutions. Um, our agenda for today, we will be covering the inverter history, uh, the SNAP inverter series. We will also look at possibilities for residential solutions as well as commercial solutions. We will take you through the installation procedure, uh, how to do to properly install Fronius inverters quickly, and then how to commission through the startup and display na navigation, and as well as look at troubleshooting and how we offer you support at Fronius. Um, at the very end, we will also do a question and answer session, and this will be looking at uh, some of the questions that you are going to be asking today in this session. As well as that, we are going to introduce two polls uh, somewhere in the middle of this presentation. And my colleague Cyprian and Mohammed are going to be launching the polls. So we kindly request that you give us your feedback on the questions that will be asked for us to be able to interact with you better and offer you better solution in terms of the information disseminated in this webinar. Um, what I'd like to mention here also is that Fronius has just in the recent past uh, celebrated uh, 75 years since it was the company was uh, in, in, initiated. The company was started in 1940 and it has been a history of su success for the last 75 years. Um, what I'd like to mention here also is that we have three business units. The very first one where the company started was in charging then came the welding division and also much later the solar business unit which was started in 1992. For today's session we, are, we will be covering the snap inverter which is the photo that you can see here circled and we will be looking at uh, the series of inverters over, offered in this category of snap inverters at Fronius. To start with, let's look at uh, the inverters that have been produced. As I said, uh, Fronius started making grid tie or on grid inverters around 1992. The very first series was uh, used in a system in 1995 and has been a slow, a, a continuous development since then up to now where we are talking about uh, this range of snap inverters since the year 2013. And uh, we are going to look into details, um, the possibilities, like I've said, of these snap inverters, which is our focus for today's webinar. Um, going further, we look at uh, the snap inverter series itself. And here I would like to introduce uh, the two types of snap inverters that we are offering. 
we do have the single phase inverters and the three phase inverters. Um, the galvo that is available from 1.5 kilowatts to 3.1 kilowatts is sort of a transformer based inverter and therefore the name galvo which means there is a possibility for galvanic isolation in the inverter itself uh, from the primo 3.0 up to the echo uh, 2725 these are transformer less inverters and uh, therefore they achieve as you're going to see a bit later much higher frequency than even the galvo inverter uh, something else to note, as far as the naming of the inverters is concerned, you can see an S or an M at the end of the series of the inverter. And where you see this S or M, it basically means this is an indication of how many MPPTs you have in the inverter. For the S, we have a single or one MPPT in the inverter, and the M signifies that the inverter has two MPPTs inside. Um, Another um, way to differentiate the inverters, whether they are single phase or three phase, is the wording itself here, primo, which means it's just giving you like one uh, output in SC and the SIMO that is giving you three symmetrical outputs in SC. Um, snap inverter series itself, let's look at uh, the features or the common features of these inverters um someone would ask why is it called a snap inverter a snap inverter comes from the fact that um, you have two different uh, units that are part of the same uh, device the first unit is the mounting bracket and as you can see here at the very top you have a huge mechanism so this mounting bracket can be separated from the inverter it's a lightweight unit and also it has uh, the terminal block where you do your dc and ac cabling so the power stage or the inverter itself once you are done with uh, the cabling and you have mounted this of course properly on the wall on a farm surface then you snap in this inverter itself into the wall bracket and hence the snap inverter because you are snapping in the inverter into the wall bracket and one of the key attributes of the snap inverter is the fact that installation can be done quite rapidly and this can take uh, less than seven minutes to have the full inverter installed um, another key feature with the fronius snap inverter is the fact that all our inverters are actively cooled um, the biggest benefits that you get out of active cooling is the prevention of hotspots and therefore you are guaranteeing a long lifespan for your electronic devices as a result of the active cooling the inverter therefore can be used in environments from minus 25 to 60 degrees celsius and because it's uh, ip65 rated then it can be used uh, also in outdoor environments of course we do recommend as much as possible that you, uh, you protect the inverter from direct heat um, the active cooling concept uh, guarantees better performance of our devices or our inverters because for all other devices that you can compare which are passively cooled and therefore this means they do not have uh, an active fan inside for every 10 degrees increase in temperature within the device then you basically cut by half the expected lifespan of your device and therefore it means when you have an actively cooled device the thermal stability for that particular inverter is much better and this has of course been a focus for Fronius where we decided that this is the best way to go and therefore have the possibility to install these inverters in a lot of different environments of course important here to mention is that the fan is only activated depending on need um the ventilation ventilation concept itself um you have two to three regulated fans and this means the fan is only activated depending on the internal temperature of the inverter and you can have two fans on the sides which are sucking air and distributing it within the heatsink in the inverter and the hot air is ex escaping from the top because of this possibility 
you can now do mounting of several inverters side to side. Of course, you have to obey some minimum uh, uh, distancing uh, recommendations from one inverter to the other so that you have enough room for each inverter to take in cold air for cooling whenever this is needed. Um, one comparison that would help you to see how important it is to do active cooling is uh, an, a study that was done comparing a Fronius device, as you can see here in red. And this is actually one of our other upcoming inverters, which is the Gen24 4 kilowatt inverter. And we are looking at the derating behavior when you have an, an actively cooled inverter and you have a passively cooled inverter as we can see here in the gray line. So you can see that when you have the, the device is not actively cooled, when it's starting to get just about 30 degrees, then it's starting to derate the output. And the derating is happening so that the inverter protects the internal electronics from damage. Because I was, I was mentioned before, for every 10 degrees increase in the uh, working uh, temperature of the electronic components, then you are almost having the expected lifespan. When you have an actively cooled unit, which is uh, represented by all Fronius inverters, then the derating happens much later at around uh, just about 50 degrees. And of course, if there are problems with ventilation and stuff like that, at some point, if the temperature registered in the heat sink does not drop, then the inverter at some point will shut off. But what this illustration can show you is that with an actively cooled device, you're going to get a lot better performance. And this is actually something that we should uh, take care of when doing installations in most of Africa, because we are facing uh, regions with a lot of different uh, climatic conditions, and some of them have very high temperatures, ambient temperatures. And of course, the ambient temperature will have a direct effect on the heating temperature and therefore the reliability of your electronic device. Um, another key feature with the Fronius Snap Inverter Series, and this is available for the Simo and the Primo. And uh, as I said before, the Simo is the three phase model and the Primo is the single phase model, is the ability to do uh, installations with the orientations uh, uh, different. So you can have a north uh, south orientation or an east west orientation. And because you have uh, two possibilities uh, with two MPP trackers inside the inverter, then you're able to treat each installation oriented in, uh, differently as a separate system, but of course combine inside the system, inside the inverter as one installation. And therefore, uh, with this broad input uh, voltage of 150 to 1000 volts DC, of course, uh, the maximum operating power point or maximum voltage of the inverter at MPP has to be respected. Um, you are able to connect anywhere from uh, six to 24 modules in series to make up one string that is connected to the inverter because of this wide input voltage. Um, Overdimensioning with the inverter is also possible, and this can also be done at the MPPT level. So, if, for instance, we can talk about uh, MPPT A and MPPT B, and in this case, for a, a, con a complete installation that is 80 plus 20, meaning that is 100% of your installation, whether oriented east, west, or north, south. Our MPPT1 or A can take up to 80% of the installed capacity of your installation, and MPPT2 or B can take 20% of that. So this is in a case where your roofing does not allow uh, even numbers of panels to be put on both sides of the orientation. So not many inverters are going to offer you this possibility in the market. If you have the possibility to do symmetric distribution, meaning that each of the orientations can take an equal number of solar modules, then each of the MPPTs can be fed with an equal amount of power split half by half, in this case meaning 75 by 75. And therefore this indicating also that you have done your oversizing on the PV side by 150%. Oversizing, of course, is quite important in a PV installation because 
depending on ambient conditions or variations in installation and stuff like that, you are assured that you are able to deliver uh, nearly the same rated output of the inverter on the AC side to your loads. Okay. Um, yeah, and basically this is uh, exactly what I've uh, talked about. But we also have uh, one more feature with the Fronius Snap Inverter Series, and this is the Dynamic Peak Manager. Because in my in the previous slide, I've mentioned about the maximum power point tra uh, trackers. And in addition to this, the Snap Inverter Series has another integrated uh, software or algorithm that is able to track uh, the best or optimal operating point better than just the standard MPPT uh, algorithms. So the dynamic peak manager in the Fronius inverter will, of course, uh, guarantee you uh, better performance. And the way this is happening is uh, by shifting the operating point. And we are going to look at how this is happening. So in this graph, we can see that we have three operating uh, conditions at three different periods of the day. We have at around 12 noon with a blue curve where we don't have shedding. And we have another instance here at nine in the morning where you have a bit of shedding, as well as eight in the morning where we have shedding as well. So when you want to get the most out of your PV installation, you look at what is the global maximum power point. So this is the IV curve of that installation or for that particular string of modules. When you have the dynamic peak manager, which is a special feature included in the Fronius Snap Inverter series, um, most inverters that do not have the dynamic peak manager will get lost at this point, which is the local maximum power point. When the dynamic peak manager is in action, it starts scanning the entire IV curve uh, periodically every five to 10 minutes, and it's finding the best operating point, which I've, as I've said, is the global maximum power point. And this happens by shifting the voltage up or down and uh, understanding whether the variation in the power output uh, calls for shifting of the operating point. So you can see in this instance, we have uh, a PV installation in kilowatts here, up to about two kilowatts. And at around nine in the morning, uh, because we have a dynamic peak manager included, you're able to get a lot more from your system at just about maybe 0 0.7 uh, kilowatts, as opposed to someone who is not using an inverter with a dynamic peak manager, who is going to get just about uh, five, uh, 0 0.5 kilowatts out of the system. So um, in another webinar, we are going to be covering uh, the aspects of the dynamic peak manager in details. But I think for today's session, because we are covering the basics of the SNAP inverter, those, this should surface as just uh, enough information to be able to assist you, to understand you, to understand the special features of the SNAP inverter series. So at this point, uh, I will be handing over to my colleague, uh, Cyprian, to take you through the next uh, session. So uh, Cyprian, uh, if you can take over from here, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, uh, David, for the wonderful um, presentation so far. And um, I will be taking us through uh, residential solutions and uh, commercial solutions in this uh, presentation. OK, so I believe we can all see my slide now. Yes. So. Uh, we will continue with uh, the residential solutions, uh, but before I do that, I would like to uh, launch a poll. So we're going to take a poll question just to sample your, your attendees' opinion. And um, yes, so I've launched the poll question. So it is, uh, what is your level of experience with the, the Fronius Snap Inverter? So please do well to respond because uh, this um, the answers you give will form the basis of um, some of the decisions we take in terms of our webinar presentations and then giving us information um, what and what uh, uh, basically needed by or from our installers 
and uh, clients alike. And then, um, of course, shape our responses with respect to these uh, answers that they give. Yeah, so we're still collecting responses. I'm going to leave the poll on for, say, 10 more seconds, just to give uh, uh, more opportunities for those that are still uh, putting in their responses. Okay, I think um, I'll close the poll now and then show us uh, the result. So uh, from what I can basically see, um, we have um, about 69% of um, attendees that have uh, basic knowledge of uh, Fronius snapping batters and then 31% uh, have um, basically no experience with Fronia snapping batters. So, which is good, and uh, I believe we're in the right track to educate us and tell us more about uh, the Fronia snapping batters and the services that they provide. So, thank you very much for your response as we continue with this presentation. Yes, so um, like I said earlier, I'll be taking us through residential and commercial. Um, solutions that is inverters that are used to provide the solutions so for basically a household uh, system we have uh, the basic setup where you have your pv system connected to uh, a string inverter and then of course supplying uh, power to the load uh, of course tied to the grid so okay so um having a glitch here with the system okay now we're gone okay um just aha uh -huh. so it's uh, stabilized now so um as we continue i'll take us through the residential um, inverters used to provide residential solutions so at first um we have the galvo uh, that ranges from power class 1.5 to 3.1 and then the SIMO that ranges from 3.0 to 8.2 and then uh, uh, the SIMO that ranges from uh, the primal that ranges from 3.0 to 8.2 okay so for the galbo we have a power class of 1.5 to 2.0, 2.5, 3, and then 3.1 kilowatts. Uh, they're basically um, single phase inverters. They have one MPP tracker. Uh, it's, um, it's a transformer based uh, inverter that uh, has a high frequency uh, transformer installed in it. And then, uh, of course, uh, has an efficiency of 96% and protection class, IP protection class of IP65. Then that of uh, the SIMO, the small SIMO um, is, uh, ranges from 3.0 to 8.2 kilowatts, as can be seen. It has two MPP trackers. It's uh, three, they are basically three phase inverters and has transformerless topology. And of course, uh, since it is transformerless, we have an increased efficiency of 98% and also a protection class of IP65. For the primal, it's um, 3.0 to 8.2. And uh, I believe my colleague, David Moangi, has uh, explained to us what the S and the M mean here. S for single uh, MP tracker and then M for multiple MP tracker. So uh, for the primal, it ranges also from 3.0 to 8.2 kilowatts. Uh, it consists of two MP trackers. It's a single phase inverter and uh, also has uh, transformerless topology and uh, same efficiency as uh, the small SIMO and then uh, same protection class of IP65. So for those that don't know, uh, IP simply means ingress protection. So it has, uh, then the 65 basically gives us uh, the degree of protection that these devices have. So for 65, it basically means that it is protected from ingress of uh, dust particles and then water particles that is jet water 
So meaning that uh, you can install this um, inverter outdoors, and of course, even under the rain, then uh, you can be sure that uh, it will have any uh, ingress of uh, water particles from rain. Yeah. So, um, in addition uh, to such a range of um, inverter, is um, the possibility of having uh, SPD uh, protection, that is, surge protection device. So this particular SPD was actually introduced last year. Um, it's basically meant to protect uh, your devices from on the DC side. So these are retrofitable, which makes it very, very easy to install. So even if you have already have uh, uh, inverters already installed without this, you can, of course, order for it and then have it installed uh, with the following uh, serial number and other details. So um, I'm going to talk about the Fronius Simo hybrid, which has been around for some time now. Um, it forms the heart of every PV storage system in that for this case, because uh, other, the other inverters we've discussed thus far are actually string inverters, meaning that uh, they're not battery connectable. They are basically string or grid tied inverters. So, but for this particular one, the Fronius hybrid, uh, you can actually have a solution, a storage solution, that is, you can connect the battery to this. Um, but I must say here for um, uh, African attendees, Africa-based attendees, it's not too common in, in Africa, but I believe we have a few installations in South Africa. But apart from that, it's not too common. But then the good news is that we have uh, uh, the Fronius Gen 24, the latest hybrid uh, inverter that took manufactured that's going to be rolled out pretty soon. Uh, we've had webinars done on that already, and of course, we wouldn't mind having a repeat of such. So for those that uh, would want to have that, so just uh, stay tuned, we will be having a rerun of uh, the Gen24 so that you could know more about our storage solution using the Gen24 uh, inverter. So, but for this, uh, we have, um, uh, it, we have it in the classes of uh, 3.0, 4.0, and then 5 kilowatt range. Um, has a great battery management system, and uh, is basically used for to obtain maximum self consumption because of its multi-flow technology. Uh, of course, it can offer you backup mode in three phase, which is something you don't really uh, obtain with uh, most um, inverters. And uh, for the battery storage systems that are compatible, uh, we have the BYD battery box, we have the Fronius solar battery, and then of course the LG Chem Resu. So um, for the multi-flow technology, it, um, apart from performing the basic function that is having a DC to AC conversion, you can also have DC to DC conversion, uh, AC to DC, and of course AC to AC, um, AC to AC. Um, yeah, it is uh, perfectly ret retrofitable. So uh, even if you have already um, um, installed um, devices or appliances, you can easily retrofit this into uh, any Fronius system. So um, that's uh, for the residential solutions. And uh, coming to the commercial solution, um, we normally employ the Fronius Simo and the Echo. I'm going to give us details about them pretty soon. And then uh, these are basically uh, implemented for large, medium and large scale systems that uh, basically range from 50 to um, uh, well into the megawatts range. So uh, they're implemented for supermarkets, commercial buildings, uh, company buildings, warehouse farms, and uh, so on. And uh, like I said, we have uh, the Echo 25 or 27, and the, and the big Simo. If you could, uh, if you had me earlier, I mentioned something about small Simo, uh, which ranges from three to 8.2 kilowatts. So that's a uh, range for the small Simo, that the small three-phase inverters. And then uh, for the big Simo, it ranges between 10 to 20. We'll have more details on that pretty soon. 
So, but uh, for commercial solutions, we tend to have a good mix of this uh, set or range of inverters to implement such large scale uh, installations. They are highly flexible in design. Uh, there's no need to, for any additional components like a DC combiner. And uh, mostly for installations, you basically need just one uh, master inverter per system, uh, installed system. And then with this, of course, you uh, tend to have a cost optimized solution. So like I said, uh, let me tell us more about these inverters. So for the big SIMO, um, it ranges from 10 to 20 in power classes of 10, 12.5, 15, 17.5, and 20 kilowatt uh, power classes. And then uh, for the Echo, uh, we just have two um, two inverters in this power class. That is uh, the 25 kilowatts and the 27 kilowatts. There's just one basic difference between these two inverters. And as you can see from the features, uh, the snapping capability, um, super flex design, Dynamic Peak Manager, Smart Grid Ready, uh, Web Server, and of course, uh, um, ventilation. It's uh, actively cool ventilation. You can see that there's just one major difference here, which is uh, the uh, superplex design, which uh, basically makes the echo much more uh, adaptable for large projects where you have the inverters. Um, usually oriented in one direction. So in such case, we normally implement just uh, one FPP tracker, and then of course you can have uh, six strings connected to this inverter. So that's for the echo. But for the SIMO, um, you, it has two FPP trackers, so you can have two by three strings. And uh, of course, uh, with this multi, multi uh, super flex design, it gives, um, it, or it gives the installer the flexibility of installing, um, doing its installation and having uh, modules in, uh, oriented in different uh, different directions. So that's the basic difference between uh, the SIMO and the ECHO. So in most cases, the ECHO sometimes is called the project-based inverter because it's uh, widely used for large commercial systems in that uh, if you have just one uh, or have your modules oriented in one direction, it's basically the best for you to use as an installer. So um, yes, that's basically it. So for the options that we have, uh, like uh, earlier mentioned, we have uh, SPD devices. The one I showed you earlier was for the small devices. This is uh, optimized for uh, the larger uh, inverters that's over voltage protection and um, we also have a DC connector kit that can be used and uh, implemented in the case where uh, you uh, combine strings then if you have to go out with larger diameter or bigger diameter cables you have this DC connector kit that will help you uh, to do so so it has um, um, of course, we're going to be presenting this in subsequent uh, presentations, webinars, so we'll have much more knowledge about how this is actually done. So just to tell us that uh, we have um, solutions for all um, orientation of connections. And then, of course, we have string fuses that helps you uh, to connect uh, strings. So um, when it comes to... Um, economical efficiency, and then of course, uh, in terms of uh, power outputs per inverter, our uh, inverter actually comes out as uh, the best when compared to our other competitors. As we can see in this case, um, in terms of power output per inverter with respect to weight, we can see that our inverter weighs lesser compared to three other competitors, and Mind you, at the same time, they are outputting the same uh, the same uh, power output. So, which basically means that our inverters are lighter, they're more economical, and of course, eventually, much more efficient. Yeah, and then when it comes to um, um, the active cooling, as uh, my colleague David Moengi has earlier um, talked about, uh, inverters go well into the range of uh, 50 
degrees uh, ambient temperature, 45 to 50 degrees ambient uh, temperature before it begins uh, to derate. Uh, for other inverters, they are usually implemented at uh, about 30 degrees ambient temperature. So this gives us a very, very good edge over our competitor. Then when it comes to, um, in most cases, as in our large scale uh, installations, uh, both for centralized and decentralized topology, you can of course have inverters well implemented. If you want to have, um, let's say, um, combiners at the beginning as in close to the site and then using um, a cable or a larger dimension cable to extend it to the inverter, which is usually implemented using the DC connector kit, as I showed us earlier. This can, this is possible, possible, very, very possible. And then, of course, if you want to have all the AC connection as in all the inverters installed at site and then connected via cable to the control panel, this is also possible. And then, of course, the inverter, the transformers you've seen here is uh, just in case you want to step it up to a medium voltage level. So, whatever orientation you want to have your installations done with, whether decentralized topology or centralized topology, we are always uh, there available and have systems or inverters available to help you do so. And uh, with these possibilities, we have a um, um, couple of large installations and uh, we can see some of the examples here. This particular one is a 4.77 megawatt uh, peak roof mounted system in the Philippines that um, helps them to achieve uh, maximum self consumption. And we have another one is our largest installation so far in Ukraine, which is about 5.1 megawatt uh, system installed in Ukraine. Um, we can see the details here. The size of the installation is 5.1 megawatt, as Elia said. Uh, it's a field installation, and uh, inverters employed were the Fronius Echo and uh, uh, Fronius Echo web, with web server that's with the data manager and the lights. So as um, this, of course, goes to tell you or to give you a good example of uh, how the ECHOs can actually be implemented in the field. So this system was actually commissioned since October 2018, and I can tell you that they've been the better for it, uh, of course, uh, deriving and harnessing enough power from the sun to serve uh, the community. So um, that's a bit of my presentation. Uh, my colleague. Mohamed Sidat will uh, continue from this point and uh, he will be taking us on installation part of this presentation. So, Mohamed, if you can now take over from here. Yeah, thank you very much, Sabrina, for your um, good um, second part of the presentation. And I will be taking over from the installation um, side of the Fronius snap inverters. So it's very important before you do a Fronius installation is to make sure that you have the correct tools as well as the um, proper inst installation manuals. Um, so generally when we recommend um, installing a Fronius inverter, um, you obviously need um, your general um, power tools, but in addition, you do need a specific screwdriver, which we always suggest that you do take on site. Um, this is a Torx um, T20 and T25 screwdriver. Um, the reason we do suggest to use this specific screwdriver is that so you can get the exact correct torque. And the torque that we are looking at um, for all screwdrivers, whether internal or, or external, on the Fronius inverters are between 1.5 to 2.5 newton meters. We also do suggest that you take your installation manual um, to site. The installation manual does come in the box um, in which the Fronius inverter is shipped. Um, it can also be obtained online. And what's also very important is to take a USB stick with the latest software um, on the USB um, on site as well. And the reason for this, um, let's say you do buy a Fronius inverter and um, you buy it from a distributor and the specific distributor maybe has this inverter sitting on his shelf for a few months. And during those few months, there's been multiple um, software updates that have been done by Fronius. And all of a sudden, this in specific inverter would be slightly out of date in terms of the firmware. And that's why it's very important that when you do go to site and when you do commission the system, um, that you do check the software is up to date. 
And a very easy way to do this is to make sure that you do take a USB stick um, to site with the latest software um, installed onto it. You can get the latest software by going onto our website, phonenews.com, um, going to our search bar and just searching for firmware. And you will get a window that will um, then appear with the latest firmware that you can download. Uh, once you have the firmware downloaded onto the USB, you just got to take it to the Phonus inverter. You've got to plug it into the inverter, go to the menu, and click on Run Software Update. What's very important is the correct method to install a Phonus inverter. I have basically indicated a five-step process um, in which this installation is done. Okay, the first step. Um, is you obviously have to unbox your furnace inverter. And when you do unbox your furnace inverter, you will see that the inverter comes in sort of two separate parts. It will come with a back plate, um, which is this little plate um, that one of the furnace employees are installing. And it also comes with a front section, which is called the power electronic stack. Okay. And that's, as you'll see on the third, fourth, and fifth image, it is indicated. So in the first image, it's very important that you do install the backplate correctly. And you can install the backplate um, using either three screws or four screws. You have to use three screws when the inverter is smaller than 8.2 kilowatts. And you have to use four screws when the inverter is greater than 8.2 kilowatts. Okay, and also you do have to drill this in with a power drill. Okay, the next important step is to then ensure that you do the connection area properly. Um, so make sure that you follow the correct procedure and you insert the DC connections and the AC connections at the exact correct terminals. I will be discussing the correct terminals a bit later on in the presentation. Um, the third image um, now indicates how the top part of the inverter, which is called the power stack, how it's basically snapped into the back plate. Um, that's another reason why we call the inverter a snap inverter, is because the front section of the inverter snaps onto the back plate of the inverter. This has multiple um, areas of advantages. Um, the first advantage, um, if the inverter does need to be serviced, um, you don't have to interfere with your DC and AC connections. You just have to pop out the top part of the inverter. And the top part of the inverter contains all the AC boards, filter boards, and DC boards um, that could be replaced. Okay, once you've done step three, um, you can then um, basically click on the power stack onto the back plate and basically screw in your screws, okay? Once you've done that, um, it's very important then to make sure that the DC switch, which is at the bottom of the inverter, is now put onto the on position. That's very important. As soon as you do that, um, it basically, basically allows DC to flow from your modules to your inverter. If that DC switch is off, it basically isolates your panels from the inverter itself. Um, so it can also be kind of seen as a safety um, feature. So if you do really need to off the um, your the DC coming from the panels in an emergency, you just have to go to the furnace inverter and switch that switch at the bottom of the inverter to the off position. Once you've done that, the, the DC is basically switched off coming from the panels and the inverter is then safe to work on the DC side. And um, obviously you have to switch off the inverter as well on the AC side if you want to do servicing as an example on the inverters. What's very important is that you have to install the inverters in the correct location. As my colleague Supreme explained earlier on, um, Fronis inverters are re rated either IP65 or IP66. And basically, that, basically what that means is that um, it is protected from any ingress of dust. And um, you can also spray um, water at the inverter in all directions and it will still continue to operate. Um, obviously, you cannot throw the inverter in a swimming pool, as an example, um, because once you do that, um, you're no longer spraying water. Instead, you the entire inverter is covering water, which is a completely different topic. Okay, but anyways, in terms of location, um, you can install an inverter indoors or outdoors. That's completely fine. Um, when it comes to elevation, that's very important as well. As soon as the furnace inverter is installed above 2,000 meters, you will get a lower DC coming from the panels. This is not because of the furnace inverter. It is because of the panels. Um, just remember, as we go higher in altitude, Okay, the lower the DC produced by any solar panel on the market will be. Okay, so that's why that's why we say above 2,000 meters you'll get a lower DC voltage, and this is due to the panels. Okay, this furnace inverter can operate up to 4,000 meters above sea level. Okay, 
Um, with Proteus inverters, um, we also do suggest that you do not install them in any toxic environment where there could be fumes that could damage the power electronics in the inverter. For example, ammonia. Okay. Um, as my colleagues spoke about earlier about active cooling, um, he did mention that a furnace inverter has fans on the exterior of the inverter that brings in cool air. Okay, and remember that those fans will bring in air from the environment. So if the air in the environment has a high concentration of ammonia, it will take that ammonia and then pass it over the power electronics. And as you know, ammonia and power electronics are not a good combination. Um, ammonia can cause the power electronics to degrade over time. Okay. So just be careful and please do not install a furnace inverter in a very toxic um, environment. Again, please don't install a furnace inverter in a place such as a barnyard. Um, the reason for this is obviously animals chew on the cables and that could pose a electric hazard as well. Okay, don't install a furnace inverter in direct sunlight. Okay. The reason for this is that if a furnace inverter is installed in direct sunlight, it will be able, it, it will heat up to levels that could exceed 55 degrees or 60 degrees Celsius. Okay. If you are going to install a furnace inverter outdoors, please make sure that you do have a little shading system over the inverter. The furnace inverter can take about four or five hours of direct sunlight a day, but it cannot take more than about five hours of direct sunlight per day. And again, please don't install a furnace inverter in a bedroom if you are very picky about any slight noise um, that won't cause you to sleep, as an example. Um, when the inverter is running at full throttle, um, it's very similar to what a gaming laptop um, could sound like. Um, you will hear this fan buzzing all the time, and if you want to sleep, um, it could be a bit irritating, and um, this could cause you to maybe um, not be able to sleep during the day. Obviously, the inverter will be shut down at night, so if you do install a furnace inverter in your bedroom at night, um, the inverter will be extremely quiet. Okay, again, um, please don't install a furnace inverter in a very static environment. And the reason for this, um, as you do know, any power electronic um, device is very prone to static damage. So if you are walking along your carpet and dragging your feet along the carpet and decide you want to open up a furnace inverter to do a board replacement, um, that could cause an issue. Okay, again, please do not install a furnace inverter in a greenhouse. Um, the reason for this is that a temperature in a greenhouse could exceed um, 50 or 60 degrees Celsius, which, which would then cause the furnace inverter to operate at its extreme limit, um, which at prolonged use could damage the inverter. A nice advantage of using a furnace inverter is that you can co mount it. Okay, so this is an extreme advantage. And the advantages behind pole mounting um, a furnace inverter would be extremely useful in a field mounted system. Um, in this picture at the bottom, I have a furnace inverter installed directly under solar panels. And this is extremely useful in a field mounted system um, because obviously now you're decreasing the cost of DC cables um, because your cables can just run directly to the inverter and you don't have to run extremely long lengths of DC cables. If you are going to mount um, the furnace inverter um, to a pole, please make sure that you use the correct kits. Um, if you do not use the correct kits and the inverter um, does have to fall and break, uh, that will not be covered under warranty. Okay. So in terms of the correct kits, um, that is the kit produced by the German company called Rital. Um, they do have offices all around the world. Okay. And they are extremely big in producing uh, for example, server racks or producing, you know, kits um, for furnace inverters that whereby you can securely mount your inverter on a pole. Okay, the next very important topic is inverter orientation. If you look at all the different inverter orientations in this picture, um, they all have one thing in common. Okay, and that one thing in common is that hot air rises. As my colleague explained earlier on, a furnace inverter will either have one um, fan on the exterior or two fans on the exterior, depending on the size variant. Okay, um, with both both cases, the fan will pull in air from the environment. Okay, that air will then be passed over the power electronics via via an internal fan. Okay, that air will then get heated up, and as you know, hot air rises. We will then have an outlet vent on the top of the furnace inverter and that hot air will then escape to the outside. If, for example, we, you do choose to install your furnace inverter upside down, okay, 
hot air is, is going to try to um, escape from the inverter, but as you know, hot air rises. And instead of the air going out to the bottom, the air will now try and escape from the top of the inverter. As you know, on the bottom of the furnace inverter, there is no air vents for air to escape. And this specific variance and specific setup could cause the furnace inverter to overheat. Okay. Just remember, um, if the furnace inverter overheats, we do have internal protection methods uh, or measures um, that can um, prevent any fire from occurring. Uh, for example, if a furnace inverter uh, internal temperature exceeds a certain, a certain limit, the furnace inverter will produce an error message and it will shut down automatically. Okay, before any further damage or before a fire can occur. Okay, so on our side, we do have internal protection methods um, to protect um, the furnace inverter as well. But obviously, you as an installer, you don't want to be receiving an error message, um, and you may be 300 kilometers away um, notifying you that your furnace inverter has shut down um, due to it overheating due to an incorrect installation. Because obviously, that could mean you'd have to go back to site, um, which could be 300 kilometers away, and you will have to. Um, do the reinstallation um, again. But very important as well is the clearance. So with furnace inverters, um, they come in sort of two sizes. Um, you get the smaller size class, which is your primal, 3 kilowatt to 8.2 kilowatts, or your simon, 3 kilowatt to 8.2 kilowatts. Okay. If you are dealing with the smaller Fronia snap inverters, you have to follow this image over here. You have to make sure that between the Fronia inverter and the wall next to it, that there is a 20 centimeter gap. And if you are going to use more than one Fronia inverter, you have to ensure that there's a 10 centimeter gap between the inverters. You also have to ensure that there is a 15 centimeter gap between the Fronia inverter and the ceiling. Okay, the reason why we recommend these gaps is because, as I told you earlier on, um, furnace inverters have an inlet fan and they have an outlet as well. And this is the very reason why you need these specific clearances, is that so air can comfortably get into the inverter and can comfortably escape the inverter. Okay. Furnace inverters are also rated for specific temperatures. So with the smaller inverters, they are rated for minus 40 degrees Celsius to 55 degrees Celsius. This is ambient temperature. Okay, so these inverters can operate without any derating on those ambient temperatures as indicated. In terms of humidity levels, a furnace inverter can operate from a humidity level of 0% up until you and humidity level of 100%. So there is no real limit on the humidity level um, in terms of operation on a furnace inverter. Okay, with the bigger inverters, such as the Simo and the Eco, um, the clearances will differ slightly from the smaller inverters. And the first clearance to note is the 10 centimeter gap between the wall and the inverter, and also the 10 centimeter gap between furnace inverters, if you are using more than one. You also have the notes of the bigger clearance in terms of the inverter to the ceiling, and that is going to be 20 centimeters. You also have to take notes of the ambient temperature. Um, so the bigger inverters, they can operate to a higher ambient temperature, and as can be shown, they can operate from minus 40 degrees Celsius up until 60 degrees Celsius. If we look on the back plate of a furnace inverter, and this is the plate which is basically drilled onto the wall, we're going to see various connection points. And this is where all your AC and DC connections will be made. Okay, the first connection point you will be seeing is the DC disconnect. And this is a switch I was talking about earlier on. Um, if this switch is on the off position, it will basically isolate um, the DC connections coming from the panels. And this is where your DC connections from the panels make basically make contact with the furnace inverter, is over those pins over there. Basically, where the DC connections are going to be made onto the furnace inverter itself, um, they will be made um, on the following points. So if you have a two-tracker inverter, such as the Fronia Simo, uh, the first tracker can take three strings. So that's string one, string two, three, string three. And each string can be 1,000 volts DC. Okay, the second tracker can take three strings as well of 1,000 volts DC each. And in essence, basically what you are creating is you are creating six six strings of panels that are in parallel. Okay, so as you know, in a parallel circuit, um, the voltage um, over those six branches, if you take the overall voltage, it will be the same. So if you have six strings of 1,000 volts DC each, the overall voltage of that parallel circuit will be 1,000 volts DC, okay? Which again follows local, local regulations as well. Okay, what's very important to note is that 
MPPT A will always have a higher um, short circuit current than MPPT 2. Okay, that's very important to note. Okay, the minus terminal will be common for both um, the first tracker and both the second tracker. Okay, we also have a strain relief, and that's to assist with your cabling. We also have the AC screw terminals. So in this scenario, we have a three-phase four-inch inverter. Um, so we have your neutral, L1, L2, L3, and we also have your earth connection. We also have the screw terminals for surge arresters. And we also have fixing screws um, that basically fix this bracket onto the back plate. We also have spacing for lugs for cable straps as well. And that just to make your cabling look a bit neater. In terms of the AC connection, uh, both for the Simon and the Eco, uh, please make sure that your cabling um, is between 2.5 millimeters squared to 16 millimeters squared um, in terms of the area. Okay. Um, in terms of the material of cabling that you can use, you can either use copper or aluminium cables. And if you now um, look on the picture on the right, um, you can see that those are your um, terminals. And those terminals basically click onto the power boards um, of the front plate of the furnace inverter. We also have a special um, connection point at the bottom of the furnace inverter, and this is where you will then run your AC cabling into the furnace inverter. If we're going to look at the DC connections a bit more closely, um, the DC connections as well, um, we specify that they should be between 2.5 millimeters squared to 16 millimeters squared in area. You can either use copper or aluminium cables. Again, depending on whether you have the um, Primo or the Simo or the Eco, they'll be able to take different amount of strings. Okay. Um, for cables do exceed 16 millimeters squared, um, the only reason that will be the case is because maybe you are using an external combiner box. If you are using an external DC combiner box, we do have a kit um, that you can basically plug um, that thick cable, which is coming from the DC combiner box. You plug it into our DC connection kit, which is indicated at the bottom of the screen over here. And that DC connections kit has six pins, and those six pins will be able to plug directly into the six pins of the DC connections. Okay. Um, just remember, um, you can either directly connect your strings um, to the furnace inverter, or you can connect your strings to a DC combiner box and then take a thick cable to the furnace inverter and use a DC connector kit, and then connect the DC connector kit to the furnace inverter. With furnace inverters, um, as my colleague um, Cyprian mentioned earlier on, with smaller inverters, less than 8.2 kilowatts, you can audit with an integrated SPD. Um, for any furnace inverter that's greater than 8.2 kilowatts, such as the Simo and the Eco, um, you can order the inverter with integrated over voltage protection. Okay. And that's indicated um, on this picture over here. Okay. So I've indicated a Simo. And as you can see, we have. Um, over voltage protection one and two. Um, the first one is for the first tracker, and the second one is for the second tracker. Okay, if you are going to order an eco, um, eco only has one tracker, and this is why you'll only have over voltage and only have one over voltage protection. Okay, in terms of the fuses, um, the eco has an advantage that you can basically order the inverter with integrated fuses. And as you can see in the little black boxes over here, this is where we have our standard 16 amp PV fuses. Okay, just remember with the over voltage protection and the fuses, you can audit as a retrofit kit from the distributor. So you can either choose to take it or you can choose not to take it. So it comes as an optional extra to the inverter. I'm now going to be moving on to the startup and display navigation. So whenever you commission a furnace inverter, the first step will always um, occur via the screen of the furnace inverter. So if you look at any furnace inverter, it will have a screen on the bottom left of the phone snap inverter you'll go to the screen you will um pop the inverter you will select the correct language you will choose your correct country setup um, for example if you are located in south africa um, south africa has a specific grid code that is called the nrs-097-2-1 um, um, if you are going to do an installation in south africa please select south africa as the correct country setup once you do that all the grid parameters will automatically be entered into the inverter okay um, and these can be grid parameters such as the trip time um, frequency limits etc if you are doing installation out of south africa in africa for example you're doing an installation in zambia um, zambia does not have a a grid code for embedded generation and hence you will then select international 50 hertz as the country setup 
You can also select the correct time, select the correct date, and you can also select to switch off the second MPPG tracker um, if you do choose to do that. If you do make a mistake anyway in this um, setup process, you can always do an AC reset. Basically what an AC reset is, you're just going to switch off the inverter on the AC uh, for about 10 seconds and then switch it back on. With Proneth inverters, we also have something called the hidden menu. Um, so with the hidden menu, um, these have to be accessed using specific codes. Okay. And the reason why we have in specific codes is because we don't want the end user to be changing these limits. The only person that we do want to be able to change these limits are the installer. Um, as you know, the installers are educated and they do know um, what specific codes mean and um, how the grid exactly operates. With the basic menu, the code is 22742. Um, in order to get um, to the input um, of the menu, you have to press the third button on the Phonis inverter five times. Okay. Once you've done that, you enter the code 22742. It will then take you to the basic menu. And once you're on the basic menu, you can basically change inverter settings. Um, you can change your tracker settings. You can do USB logging. You can um, change the input signal. Um, we can also do a total reset of any log data. Okay, if you are using the Galvo, you can also change the grounding settings. Let's say if you did make a mistake on the country setup, um, you can always change the country setup by typing 73887 on the inverter screen. Um, you can then select the correct country setup. If you do want to get a um, report of all the error codes um, that has maybe occurred on the inverter, you just have to type in 37767 on the inverter. Okay. Um, if you, for example, um, want to set up a key lock on the inverter, you can do this. And the code for that is 12321. And once you enter the screen code um, on the inverter, um, it will basically lock the screen of the inverter. So it kind of acts as a child protection lock. Okay, the last menu um, is the pro menu. Um, you might be asking why I haven't displayed it on the screen. Um, the reason for this is that we only issue this code if you request it directly from us and if you have a good enough reason um, for requesting this code. Okay, the reason for that is because you can now basically change um, specific limits on the country setup, such as the trip limits, trip time, frequency limits. Um, and these are basically all limits um, that the inverter will basically either trip according to or not. Okay, and this is very important because at the end of the day, the Phonics inverter is connected um, to the national grid. Okay, so we have to comply with the national grid regulations, but in a specific case uh, where the national grid will allow you to change those limitations, um, let's say, for example, you are located on a farm um, somewhere in Namibia, as an example, um, and you're located right at the end of the transmission line. Okay, the voltage you're going to pick up at the end of the transmission line can be as low as 150 volts. Okay, whereas our inverter will be trained to trip at 170 volts, as an example. So you as an installer will have to change that 170 volts to 150 volts as the lower trip limit, as an example. And that's why it could be useful to request the pro code um, from us. You can either request it from the technical sales advisors or you can request it from tech support. When it comes to servicing Proris inverters, it's extremely simple and straightforward. Uh, with Proris inverters, we offer a very fast and easy servicing procedure. Um, so basically how a furnace inverter servicing will occur, um, a trained installer will go onto site, okay, he will receive an error message, um, so he will know before he goes onto site exactly what um, replacement boards to bring. He will bring that specific replacement board and he will then um, carry out the replacement. As you can see, I have some pictures at the bottom just indicating exactly how the furnace inverter's boards can be revealed, is by taking off the front cover. And um, we do offer much more intense training into board replacements. And this will be done in future webinars um, as well. I'll now be moving on to troubleshooting. Um, it's a very straightforward procedure. Um, the end customer um, will receive an error code. Um, you either get an email or the installer can even get the email sent to him as well. Okay. Either the end customer or the installer will get an error code. Um, they will then use the SOS tool. Um, which we will be talking about in part two of the three part series, or they can directly call the Fronius tech support hotline. Okay, using either, the, either of the two methods, um, they can now come to a diagnosis of what exactly is wrong with the system and then request an exchange part. Okay, that exchange part can then be requested from the distributor, um, and the distributor will then dispatch the exchange components to the installer. 
The train installer will then go to the customer and replace the board. Okay, so this basically allows for extremely fast servicing. Um, so from the time there is an error on the system to the time the system is, um, the specific board is replaced, it can be as fast as one or two days. Okay, so that's all the main content for today's webinar um, for part one out of our three-part series. Um, I'm just going to now um, finish off the last slides. After this, we'll also be having a Q&A session. So please stay behind for the Q&A session, uh, which will go on for about another 10 or 15 minutes for. Okay, so um, why choose Cronius? Um, again, we have, in terms of solar division, we have 27 years of experience. In terms of the overall company, we have 75 years of experience. Um, it's a family-owned business, so we're extremely, um, when it comes to, um, you know, our finances are extremely well looked after. Um, in terms of international support, we can, um, you know, really look after a wide um, client base. And um, we always provide solutions for energy flow management, and we also always have a look at um, the quality um, and always try to improve our inverters as well. Okay, and we also have um, Fronius system partners that are located all around the world. So even in countries where we do not have a subsidiary um, established, we do have multiple Fronius system partners established. And these are installers that have been for multiple trainings and are extremely well versed on Fronius um, technology and Fronius knowledge. We also have a um, wide um, base of Fronius technical sales advisors that are located around the world that can also assist you in any questions you do have. We also have the tech support line, um, which can also offer you um, free support as well. Okay, I'm now going to be launching a poll. Um, I'd appreciate it if everybody could answer the question. Okay, so the question is, what size PV installations do you mainly install? Okay, you can please select one. Um, the first option is you mainly install from 0 to 10 kilowatts. And that would make you a primarily a residential installer. Um, or you install 10 to 100 kilowatts, that would make you a small commercial installer. Maybe you install between 100 kilowatts to 1 megawatts, that would make you a medium commercial installer. Or maybe you're a really big EPC, or maybe you are from a utility and you do um, greater than 1 megawatt installations. Um, so please really appreciate your input and your answer to that question. I will be keeping um, the questions open for about another 20 seconds for you to um, answer the poll. Um, so yeah, please share your inputs. Okay, I'm now going to be sharing the results. As you can see, the majority of today's attendees are small commercial installers, which is very good to hear. Um, again, with Fronius, we see ourselves as a company that does residential, primarily um, small commercial and medium commercial. That's where we are extremely active um, in the field of um, PV um, installations. Okay, I'm now also um, going to um, display um, on the screen um, a lot of contact details of any um, specific contact lines that you need to contact. Any technical questions you need, any trainings, any sales um, queries you need or any after sales queries, please contact um, one of the following contact numbers. Or if you are located in Africa, and please locate, um, please contact your specific technical sales advisor. Okay, we will now be doing a 10 minute QA session. Um, so I'd like to bring in at the most popular questions asked in today's webinar, and he will be asking me um, those questions. And again, um, I please encourage you to please keep your questions coming in. And we will try and answer as many questions as possible um, in this webinar. Um, we will be keeping this webinar open for 